Well, it's a joy to have you today. We're glad you're here. Are you glad to be here? Yes. yes. Uh, are you afraid you're going to get sunburned today when we go outside? <laughs> <laughs> That's some kind of overcast day, isn't it? Yeah. The, uh, you know, I, I used to, I read the anecdote, and I'd like to say it at times, that, that um, a, a man was in, in bed on a Sunday morning, and he had the covers pulled over his head, and his wife came in and said, you've got to go to church. Come on, get up. we got to go. He goes, tell me one good reason why I forgot. She said, you're the pastor. And I, so, so, you know, and some days we feel that way, you know, and so it's important to know. Uh, you know, through, through our three sessions, we've really been talking about building an environment to raise healthy children. Uh, you know, the thing is, we're all part of a big environment, but each one of our homes has its own environment. And, uh, you know, I hear people bemoan the way schools may be, the way the country may be, the way whatever may be. But the thing is, we also have a responsibility to realize we have an environment in our home. And, and your home has a, a certain feel. Your home has a certain touch. Your, your home can be a place of refuge, even though you may live in a chaotic community. And, uh, you know, I know that doing work with uh, inner city people in East Baltimore uh, is such a chaotic place. But many of the moms, especially, uh, because there was few dads around that were responsible in that place at that time, those moms would say, we want our place to be a place of safety for our kids. We want them to feel at home, and we want them to have love, and, and to realize that God is good. And, you know, and when people would say often to me, how can you bring God up if you're doing ministry to take care of physical needs? I said, you cannot help it when you live in a chaotic environment, because they know they could die any minute. I mean, I mean, you know, and, and so God is an ever-present reality. So you can talk about Jesus real easy uh, in that environment. But the thing I want you to know is you're responsible for your place. You know, you're not responsible for everybody else's place. And that's why we're not an expert on everybody else raising their kids. You, you know, well, here's what I would do. Uh, th that, that can lead to some pretty crazy things. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't give counsel. If you shouldn't give a, a word of correction if you see something that needs to be done. But you need to do that in a tactful way. You need to do that in a gracious way, and you need to do that in an understanding way that uh, except for the grace of God, I'd go there too. And so that's really important for us to understand. Uh, the first thing we really talked about, the first major thing, you have, you've got to commit to enjoy your children. <laughs> you know, if you don't enjoy your children, they know it. And, and we just, they, they know if you um, endure them or if you put up with them. They know how you think about them. The second major thing we had is that it's, it's really important to have a calming influence in your family. We live in a hectic world that is like this, and you, you need to have a calming influence. Because one day your kid is gonna ask you something or tell you something from school, and your hair is gonna stand up. Even if you're like me and you probably don't know how much, it's still gonna do that. And you're gonna go like, and you're gonna wanna react. And I've got a whole section that we'll talk about next week about that, but you're gonna wanna react. And the way you respond in that moment when that kid comes home and says, you know, Jenny got busted from, from um, drug possession today, the, the way you deal with that is really is going to be really big in, going forward. We'll get to there later. Calming influence. Um, be fully alive. Be present in your kid's life. Uh, don't, don't be a, a father who did what I did when my kids were young at times. I, I loved to read a newspaper, and I would read the paper at, when I came home because that was my time just to enjoy for me. And so one day one of my kids was talking to me, and I said, uh-huh, and he said, Daddy, say it with your eyes. <laughs> oh, man, it cut right to my heart. Daddy, can you say that to me with your eyes? Because I wasn't looking at him. You know, I was just doing the dad thing. And um, so, so don't, don't be there, you know? And then uh, last week, we, and this is what I want to bleed into today, you're always teaching. You're always teaching your children. Um, you know, the, I love the way Deuteronomy 6 says it. It says, you know, you shall teach these things when you lie down at night, when you rise up in the morning, when you walk by the way. You're teaching these things. Uh, most of life is walking by the way. You, you don't teach intentionally. Uh, Becky and I did home ed. And one of the things that Johnny did suffer through, and Adrian especially, I, I was teaching them Latin. And then I wanted to teach them a little Greek too, because I knew that. And so we, I was doing this language teaching. And what I didn't realize, I would want to teach them an hour. And I didn't realize something. When I, when I would sit down to teach this wonderful lesson that, that had gripped my soul, I didn't realize they were in a class of one or two. 
So your mind can't wander. You, 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 you know, if you're, if you're in a class of 20, you can kind of take a break for a minute. You can mentally check out. And nobody knows it necessarily unless your teacher calls on you and says, read next, and you go, oh, God, where are we? You know, I've had that happen before. But they couldn't check out, and I didn't realize how much stress I was putting on them to concentrate that long. I had no idea. And I, I learned that after they were all through. Sorry. But, I, <laughs> yeah, that's the way that would go. So be, be fully alive, but also realize where you are. You know, most of life teaches... Uh, our lessons are taught on the everyday walk. That, that's really important to learn how we respond. Uh, let me give you a couple of illustrations on that. Becky and I taught boundaries by not trying to really teach boundaries. We were trying to take care of ourselves. But uh, we had a thing where we had five boys, and we would be able to say to them, look, if you see a necktie hanging on the door, that means you don't touch the door. If it's hanging on the door, on the doorknob outside, that, that's mommy and daddy time and we don't need you to buy. Now, we would use that for intimacy. We would use that for conversation. We would use that. It wasn't just at night they saw the tie. They would see the tie there. And I know one night, <laughs> it was hilarious. The tie was on the door, and all of a sudden I hear the scratch and the doorknob starts to open. And then he goes, oh, my God, there's a tie on the door. He said, tie on the door. I didn't mean to touch it. I didn't mean to touch it. And, you know, you know that was uh, interesting. And I, I had to go kind of soothe his spirits a little bit. But, but those are things. What, what we were teaching there, is proper boundaries. We, we weren't trying to say, don't ever do this, even though that, that really came across, that message came across. But the thing is, that means we respect others, we respect space, we have to learn those things. Now you can teach boundaries in a lot of different ways, but if you live with a boundary, that helps them learn a boundary. And, and they'll see it that way. Uh, one of my favorite times of learning came when um, Becky, I called Becky, I was in Memphis on a uh, seminary thing, and uh, I called in to see how the kids are doing. And she tells me that morning, she says, oh my God, I don't know what to do. She goes, Stephen used the F word today. Now Stephen's four and a half years old. <coughs> you know, he's, he's not quite five. And she goes, he used it, and, and I'm not talking about fire truck. Okay, well, not, <laughs> that's not the F word I'm talking about. But he, 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 she said, what do I do? I said, chill, be calm, don't make a big deal about it, and I'll deal with it when I get home. And as soon as I hung up, I went, dear God, what am I going to do? You know, you know, but I, I'm trying to manage, you know, difficulty here. And so when I get home, uh, we have a family meeting. And uh, they're all sitting on the couch, kind of like that. And then five of them, if you can imagine, five stair steps here. And uh, you've got two four and a half, the fives, the twins, and then a, a, a two-year-old below them, you know, and then, uh, then the two olders. And um, I said, I understand that you guys had an interesting breakfast the other day. And then uh, somebody said something that really kind of got Mama going a little bit. And they're all going like, mm -hmm. and they're all looking at the one. And, and they're kind of like, well, he's going to get it. You know, yeah, he's going to get it. And I'll never forget how that went. Because I was watching them, and they were as cute as they could be. And I said, you know, I had to remember, number one, the kid had no idea what he was saying. Uh, uh, you have to remember that, you know. So, and it's not time to teach him what he's saying. That's not it. So what am I going to do? So what I did was this. I said, you know, I am so glad I called him by name. I'm so glad you didn't say the worst thing you could have said. Because he thought he had. He thought he had said the very worst thing he could possibly I said, you know, you could have used God's name in vain. That's the worst thing you can do. As a matter of fact, the Scripture tells us if you use God's name in vain, it's not forgiveness for that. Right? You know, you know, God will not hold you guiltless if you take His name in vain. And I said, so I'm glad you didn't say, and I said, you didn't say GD, you didn't say, oh, Jesus Christ, you didn't, you didn't do that. I said, Steve, I'm, oh. I said, I'm so glad you didn't say the worst thing. He goes, like, oh. and I said, you know, there's another kind of talk, because that's the worst thing you can say. You also didn't do this other thing, it's called, it's called um, profanity. I said, profanity is when you take a, a, a sacred topic, but you take it to your own use, put it in your own hands. I said, that's like when our neighbors say, damn you to hell. I said, no human has that responsibility. No human has that right. But when you hear our neighbors say that, that lets you know, you know, that's profane. That's not a proper use of language. That's taking the holy and doing it. And that's when you say Ham, uh, hell, damn, you know, any of those words. Say, that, that's not, we don't want to do that either. That's profanity. But that's still not the worst thing you can say. The worst thing you can take God's name. And then I said, then there's another thing called vulgarity. It, the Bible calls that coarse speech. And I said, that's what you did. I said, Steve, that's what you said. It was coarse. And I said, do you notice who it bothered most in the room? It was her. It was your mommy. I said, you know why? Because she's soft-hearted. And now, remember, this is over 30 years ago. Okay, this is a long, 35, about 35 years ago. 
I said, if you hear a woman using that kind of speech, she's a pretty hard woman. Most women don't talk that way. You know, you don't hear that. And that was 35 years ago. Not true today. But um, I said, uh, that's the kind of, and you know they said? Oh, yeah, yeah, she's right on the street. <laughs> they knew who the woman was, you know, because that's where they heard it. And the thing that is, what it did, it gave a teaching moment, because what I ultimately said is, would you make a commitment with me for us not to use that kind of language? I said, if it hurts mommies, we don't want to do that. That, that hurts any mom. That's not good. I said, now I want to tell you this one other thing. I said, with language, there's a thing called expletives. Expletives. And I said, what that means is things explode out of you. I said, it's kind of like one day you're going to play football. They know we're just about getting to the age of I said, somebody's going to plow into your back one day, and you're not going to be aware of it. And that helmet's going to hit you in the back, and you're probably not going to go, goodness gracious. <laughs> That's not the kind of word that just flies out. And I said, there is a time and a place for certain language. And there's a time and a place not for certain language. I said, military guys often use coarse language in the way that they train and what they do. I said, it happens in athletics as well. I said, but we want to be men who have good manners. And so that was a teaching thing that I didn't plan on teaching that. But all of a sudden, life happens, and we have to be there. So that's why it goes really important, back to that second thing we said, be a calming influence as much as you can. If we are emotionally charged, you have a hard time getting anything on their heart because they're afraid. They have fear. They have anxiety. Uh, you know, when in Deuteronomy where it says, you shall write these things on your children's heart, the word there literally is this, you shall cut them into their heart. It's the idea that you're making a carving to where it doesn't go away. It's the idea of a tattoo. You know, in that sense, you get a tattoo, it's there. You know, you're not just going to go get rid of it. It's not like washing something off. So, on learning, we teach as they walk along the way. Um, does that make sense to you? Do you have any questions about that? Do you understand why I did what I did? I mean, do you understand the progression of the way we did it? Now, that took me time to think about what I was going to say. But the good news is, I had that time. And had I been there at that moment, I don't know what I would have done because I wouldn't have been ready to handle that. I'm glad that I wasn't there. And I can say to Becky, relax, chill. I will take care of that when we get home. And so uh, she just thought I was going to beat him to death. But um, not really. <laughs> you know, she didn't know. Now, here's one other thing that's really important. When you're teaching your children, Remember this, wherever you put them, whatever you enroll them in, whatever group they're a part of, you are the center of their learning. And, and what that means is, if, if they're in a group, if you've got them in a place where you're concerned about what they may be hearing, maybe you take them out of that place. You know, I, I, I've been, you know, as a pastor, I've had to learn the hard way that you can have Sunday school teachers who can teach bad doctrine to your children. They can teach you to be afraid of God. They can teach you to think that, that you don't have self-worth. You know, when, when uh, you know, I had one teacher in our church in Pittsburgh many years ago, but, but she said, she liked to say, no child ever leaves my class that doesn't accept Christ before they get out. And she was teaching seven-year-olds. I said, that's not healthy. That's not healthy for you to say that's your goal. When you do that, you put undue pressure on the child and you don't let the seed really grow in their heart. Now, I'm, I'm for the idea of every child coming to know Christ. But i got to tell you, you can't tell somebody when they become a Christian. You know, God does that. Somebody say amen? amen. I mean, I mean, and so we've got to be really careful. And so I had to go to that teacher and say, you need to back that off. That's not healthy. Or you don't need to teach here. You know, and that, that wasn't fun. But the thing is, you, you, you can't allow that to be happy. You're, you're your parent. You're, you're the parent. You're responsible for your child. And so that really, you know, if, if there are places that, uh, where you know they're hearing some negative things, and that can be somebody else's house, it can be in, influences of people. You've just got to be on guard about that. You pray about it, and you don't become cynical of people, you don't become sarcastic of people, and you don't become ostracizing of people. But the most important thing you do is realize this child is my responsibility. You know, uh, God is not going to hold somebody else responsible on that. that that's, that's with me. And so I am the parent. Uh, the thing that is beautiful is you have, how many of you have a table in your house that you eat around? Okay, we have one, huh? Now, here, the Hebrew uh, culture has a great line. It says, every table is an altar. And they didn't mean tables at church. They meant at your home. 
Yeah, every table, it, that's the center of conversation. That's the center of where learning happens. And that's where they're exposed to. So uh, one other thing to say that's really important. When you, I have a lot of parents say to me, I'm not sure what to teach them. Yeah, I'm not sure what I need to teach. And, and we have this vague idea that there's something I ought to give them. And I want to make sure, it, whether it's a catechism, whether it's a, you know, what, whatever it might be, I want to make sure I teach them. I want to make sure they get the Bible stories they ought to have. Now, now when a parent comes to me and they're anxious about that, what I will often ask them, I say, what stories are those? Which stories should they? They go, that's why I'm asking you. I say, well, which stories are important to you? It's amazing how many times they don't have a story. They don't know. They just got this vague guilt that they ought to know something. I don't, we don't deal with vagueness. We don't deal with nonsense. We don't deal with guilt that they get. What we have to te do is say, why don't you learn with your child? Instead of saying, somebody teach that, why don't you learn with your child? When they ask, and this is a big thing, what doctrines do they need to know? I say, which ones changed your life? Now the thing is, that puts it where it ought to be because parents ought to be learners as well as teachers. And see, what we have to learn, if it doesn't work for you, why would you teach it to your child? Seriously. We have to think about that. And the thing is, I would encourage you, think about the great thoughts you want to give to your child. What thoughts about God do you want them to know? I gotta tell you, you want them to know that He is a creator. He made this incredible world. He made them. They have value. He loves them. He wants them. You know, uh, he is a God who wants all of us to come home. Uh, we, we don't know if what fear is. Um, so I suggest what you do, give witness to your child of what changed you. Tell your children what, you, instead of you trying to manufacture a story, tell them your story. What event changed you? And you may say, well, that was a bad lesson. It was a hard lesson. You know, your children can handle that when you tell it the right way. As a matter of fact, if you learn with your child, they will find out that you're thirsty, that you're hungry, and that lets them know that's okay. They're looking for truth as well. And that's what we're, where I'm going right there is the, the pivot to the next thing. You're always teaching. So here's the thing. Give, here's number five if you're counting points. Give your child as little as possible they have to unlearn later. Now, what that means is, if you think it's lame, why teach it to your child? Um, I'm going to give you some personal illustrations about that. If you if your child is learning something that you think is crazy, <laughs> get them out of there. I mean, you know, figure figure that out. Because listen, sometimes it's not about our kids; it's about us. Our conflict is not. Uh, 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 with our kids, it's, it's ourselves. If we can't explain things that we're uncomfortable with, how are they going to be able to explain it? Now, let me give you an illustration. Uh, I raised my kids to believe in a literal six-day creation. I believe in, I led them to believe in a new, new earth, meaning it's only six thousand years old. And I, you know, and I, and I taught them what my teachers had taught me, as far as Bible. But you know, when I would take them to the museum, they loved looking at the dinosaurs. I mean, that was one of their favorite things, man. And that was even before Jurassic Park. But they loved going with those dinosaurs. And they'd say, wow, those things are huge. And I go, yeah, they are. God made them. They go, like, well, when? And they say, this, this thing here says that they're this many years old, you know, way older than 6,000 years. And I go, like, well, you know, there's ways you can explain that. And, and I started giving what I had been taught. You know, here's how that, and I was using a certain group in their curriculum and stuff. And then I had to realize one day, that doesn't really make good sense. It's not that I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe that way of reading the Bible. I believe the Scriptures. I love the Scriptures. I read the Scriptures every day. I love the Scriptures today more than I ever have in my life. But what I had to realize, that number one, the word yom in Hebrew, in six days, yom doesn't always mean a 24-hour period. It can mean a period of time. It means any number of things. Also, when you, you know, as you read the scriptures, you realize they're not trying to give you a scientific account of how the world was made. As a matter of fact, the other thing is when I, the, looking at nature did that to me, but also looking at what I call the universe. 
Man, what I'm seeing with these pictures coming in from the web, I'm just going like, this is incredible. And it's that many billion years away, light years, going at 186,000 miles per second. And I'm going like, that's so expansive. Now, sure, it could have been created 6,000 years ago. That's possible. It's really not very plausible. And you know what? It doesn't hurt my faith at all to say God made this. And look how incredibly expansive it is. And don't we believe God's an eternal God? No. He's got times one thing doesn't bother him. <laughs> he's, that's a construct we have, not a construct he has. And he's always calling us to get into the next world, meaning the heavenlies. He wants us to walk by faith, not by And everything I was trying to teach them was stuff you could see, feel, touch, you know, and put it here. And the thing that just is icing on the cake for me, going to, on our trip out west three years ago, when I go out there and see Grand Canyon, and I see these layers and layers and layers and layers, and I go like, that's incredible how this thing is made. I look at the mountains, and I just see it, and I go like, you know what, I'm so glad I'm not hung up on trying to think about that the wrong way. I, could, I never felt God's prayer. I mean, it was such a strong feeling of the presence and worship of God. You just say, God, you're expansive, you're awesome, you made these things. Now, I use that as an illustration because we will often do that and try to fit our children's knowledge in a box, and then they're going to come home one day. And, and by the way, this happens with regularity. Kids go to college, and they're taught things that they were taught are wrong, and they have a conflict, and what they do, they throw their faith out. Because they say, this makes sense. Now, the thing we have to do, don't teach your children things they have to unlearn later. Teach them, and, and by the way, the best definition I know of uh, faith and how to use faith is uh, in Rob Bell's book on, called The Velvet Elvis. And it's a, it's a book about faith and belief. But he says this. He said, many of us have taught that faith is like a, a wall. And you, you build brick upon brick, line upon line, precept upon precept. He said, but if you pull one brick out, the whole wall starts to you know collapse if you pull one out. He said, think of your faith rather than that. And, and by the way, the, when it says that in the scriptures, it says don't move the ancient boundaries that, that your fathers have set. You know what that was talking about? That was talking about those stone walls that they build where they put rocks on top of each other because they have earthquakes over there. And when they have an earthquake, the, the wall may shift a bit, but it's still there. You see it. it, it, it but it's, they're not talking about brick upon brick like we would have here with an earthquake. You know, it's a different kind of building. So that picture wasn't something that never shifted. It was the fact that they had a property line, and, and you didn't go past that. Now, here, I like what Bill says. He said, think of your faith as a trampoline more than a wall. A trampoline is made to jump on. It's made to jump. So jump. He says, if one spring breaks, you don't have to quit jumping. Still works. It says when your children, if they learn that our faith has an elasticity about it, and when we have a doubt about one, just keep on jumping. Keep on in your faith. Keep on loving Jesus. Keep, that question is not the most important question. Just say, say that's not the biggest deal. That doesn't take everything away. Keep jumping on the trampoline. And you know, if you break enough springs, you got to go fixed. Okay, that, that does have to happen. But we, we get really bothered if we think that's one bit of deviation. And the thing that I would say, you want to be in a church where the Word of God is taught, it's understood, and it's taught in a way that makes good sense. It's taught in a way that you go like, you know, I've got questions about this at times. As a matter of fact, um, I'm in a group <laughs> where we're looking at the life of uh, David and, and Saul. And, uh, you know, it's really funny. David, in, in, in 1 Samuel, it says that David has played for Saul David has been there. Saul has said, this, you're a fine young man. You're the son of Jesse. And then a few chapters later, it's, David does the uh, Goliath thing. And Saul says, who is that kid? And you go like, why, why does he ask that question? Because he knows who he is. He knows he's the son of Jesse. And, he go, and what we realize is, is that Samuel has more than one author. I mean, it's not Samuel didn't say just write that. That, that happened during his time, but his time periods. And what we realize is they're not trying to tell a chronological history that is the way we would read it. They're just telling the story of how these things evolve and how they work. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're not afraid to say to your child, believe this. You can go to the bank on this. You can always know Jesus loves you. Of all the things you can ever challenge, Jesus loves you. Because no, they're going to one day wonder if Jesus does love them. 
that when they do the real bad thing, and they've got to understand that you have shared them enough to let them know, no, He loves us in spite of. It's not a plastic love. It's a real love. Now, I know that's kind of a deep topic there, but give your kids as little as possible that they have to unlearn later because they want to learn to hear your voice. They want to learn to hear God speaking through you and through His Word, not just uh, a mechanical voice, if that makes sense. Do you have any questions about that? That that may be something you do want to discuss. I don't know. Does it make sense what I'm saying to you? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it, what you said is accurate. Like, just to give a faith that is their own, Yeah. they can withstand some of the stuff and testing, because like, you don't know what's going to come in their life, like what they're going to face and... You know what? What way that's gonna be attacked or questioned, or what other thing you're gonna experience that's gonna say? So you try to just provide them the base to be able to do that. Like you said, maybe it's a small trampoline at first, mm -hmm. but you know, as you grow in your faith and as you grow stronger in sort of understanding some of the ways of God, like it's always tested, but you yeah. can you have a base to be able to to weather all of those storms and those other things that happen. What, one of the worst things you can do is think this is an answer book that gives you an answer for everything. The Bible is not a guidebook for life. It, it does guide you in life. It's a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. But it is not the answer Say, let me get to Google and say, where's this in here? Uh, you know, when I realized this woman is the woman I wanted to marry, she didn't realize that she wanted to marry me. Okay, that, that's really true. When I said to her, I love you, I got that wonderful response. I can't say that. <laughs> you know, that. That'll bless your heart. Now the thing is, I did not have a verse in the Bible that says Becky is the one. I had read a lot of the Bible and I saw good characteristics that I thought a woman of faith ought to have. And she hit every one of those. And I said, that's worth waiting on, that's worth, that's worth going for. And I did, and I'm glad. But the thing is, you're not going to find an answer for everything you're looking for in there. That's why we have wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, do you know who wrote that? A guy who wrote part of the Bible. <laughs> he didn't say, read my book and you'll know. He said, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he will give it to you. you know, that is so important to do. It's so important to understand. The scriptures do lead us. They do guide us. They are living. They are alive. We have a relationship with this incredible book that shows us, but we don't worship the book. The book points us to a relationship with Christ and to have a good understanding for living life. And that is just a critical marker uh, to have in our heart uh, as we go forward. And, you know, the other thing that is really important, when you hold the scriptures with that kind of wisdom, it helps your children have confidence. That is so, now, let me ask you this. Moses is taken to Pharaoh's house. The scriptures say he is raised in the ways of Egypt. That means he knew all about the Egyptian gods. That means he was trained to think. Ra, Ramses, you know, this is going to be the Pharaoh. You're going to have the, the sun. Ra, you're going to have the Nile. All these things. Moses, the scriptures tell us, one day decided that's not a good way to view life. I'd rather go with the way of my fathers. That's the truth. And it says, Moses laid down what he could have had to follow the one that he knew was true. And the thing, that's what we want to be about. He didn't have all the answers. But I tell you what he did have, he had a, he had a mooring. He had a, a confidence where God could reveal to him. And the thing is, what Moses really learned, it was on the job training just like we do. He's out and he's doing his sheep one day and the Lord appears in a burning bush. Uh, that had never happened to me. But, but you know, that was the way he learned. And I think what God is saying to us, He can talk to you. He will lead you. He will guide you. His Word is a core for us. But He will lead us as we understand that Word. So don't teach your children making it magical to where they go, if I just quote the Bible, I'll have it. That, that's not a good way to live life. Number six. Um, and this flows right out of time. Encourage your kids to ask questions. Encourage them to ask good questions. Uh, questions are the lifeblood of life. You know, um, if you learn how to ask good questions, I, I like what it says in Exodus 12 when they're preparing for the Passover. And the Lord, and they, of course they wrote Torah where they would teach the children. It says, when your children ask you, what does this mean? You tell them. As a parent. You say, the Lord delivered us with a mighty hand from the hand of Pharaoh. 
That's why we eat this meal. It's the night we were delivered. So that is such a, there's a beautiful insight. It says when your children ask you what this means, that, that assumes that you're talking with your kids. <laughs> that assumes that you're not going to go, don't ask questions about it, just do it. You know, we don't want to do that. We, you know, why, why do we read a Bible? Don't ask that, just read it. No, why do we read a Bible? Well, it nurtures your heart. It strengthens your understanding. It lets you understand how God is. You understand how, how good God is. It understands your place. It, it'll help you understand how we can know Him. All the, the, we read a Bible for a reason, not just because. So when your kids ask questions, realize their questions are not a threatening thing to you. They're not a problem for you. As a matter of fact, it's an assumption. When your kid asks you a question, they're assuming you have something to say. That's why they ask you a question. They want to hear your voice about whatever they're asking you about. Now, it, it can be kind of crazy when they're little. Daddy, why is this? Mommy, why is this? Why? You know, and then it goes boom, 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 boom. Now, remember, we said this early on on joining your children. The very things that you wish they wouldn't do when they're young, you're going to beg for them to do as they get to be adults. Keep talking to me. I can't tell you how many parents say, my kids don't talk with me anymore. And you know what? That's because of the other things. And, you know, we've got, to, we've got to realize, keep that conversation going. That's another whole point in a few, in a, you know, as we go down next week's lesson. But the, th the questions, they're feeling secure enough to ask you about things that matter. Especially as they're getting older. I'm not talking about three-year-olds and two-year-olds, you know. But you, but you still give them, that, that's a good thing to do. But, you know, when your child asks you, why do we do this? Why do we believe this? You know, why is that wrong? Why is it wrong to steal? Because I can get it. Why is that wrong? And you, 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 we need to have an answer. We don't just go like, well, it says don't steal. That's true. But there's a better reason than that. that you know, you teach them, you know, what, when you work and earn something, you appreciate it a whole lot more <coughs> than if something comes to you, uh, in a, especially in an illicit way. Um, your kids need to know they can ask you about things that is important. And the assumption is this. You've previously owned your own past, so you can talk about that. Uh, when kids ask, uh, why should I not sleep with her if it's a boy? Why, sh why, should, why, why is sexual purity important? Why is that? We have to own our stories enough to be able to say what we struggle with, what we failed in, what we, uh, quite honestly, were graced through, that God blessed us. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean we're, that we shrink from questions because we haven't asked them of ourselves. You know, why do I believe the Bible's true? Uh, why, why do I think church is important? Why do we go there? You know, you better have some answers more than saying God said so. Ultimately, they'll say God's a killjoy at that point. But why do we do that? It's a place where we make friends. It's a place that we learn to serve. It's a place we can help others. It's a place we can learn the most important things in life together. It's a place where we can make decisions as a group without fighting and without hurting. We can do things that are not always easy. My kids asked me a question one day. Can I play ball on Sunday? Now again, this is 40 years ago. But um, I, one of my boys was a good enough athlete that he was recruited to play on teams that really played on Sunday. And we'd always had a rule. No ball on Sunday. That was our because I was raised that way. <laughs> okay? I hadn't thought it through. Okay? And so all of a sudden, you're a pastor as well, and people are looking at you. What are your kids going to do? Because maybe that's maybe you'll make our decision for us. <laughs> I don't want to make a decision. And so the pastor thought about it long and hard. The pastor talked to his wife, uh, and, and I said, you know, I think it's really crazy for him not to be able to play on this team. He loves it, man. They love him. It's, it's a good relationship. We're going to be friends with these people. We'd never know otherwise. And I go, like, I think it's kind of crazy. And so I said, well, here's what we're going to do. Uh, at that time, we had two or three services at our church. I said, if you go to the early service, you don't have to stay for, there we had Sunday school, like, like group time. You don't have to stay for Sunday school. You can go play on the team. But, but we're going to honor God on His day. We're going to do that. We're always going to honor God on His day. That's important. Okay, but we and you know what I've got to tell you what has happened in America over the last thirty years on Sundays. 
<laughs> it is no longer considered a holy day. It's no longer considered God's day. I mean, it's my weekend. And I, I, I do whatever I want to in that. So we have to ask the question, why do we do what we do? Why, why do we alter? Uh, you know, uh, parents have to say, you know, kids have track meets, they have swimming things, they have soccer games, they have, you know, whatever it is. And you have to teach them this. We're not legalistic to say you've got to do it this way, but you've got to find a way to have a reverence for the Lord's Day. And you also have to feed their spirit. And whatever it is they're doing, make sure you feed their spirit. And going to church may or may not be the best way to feed your child's spirit. Uh, but I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is we have to understand that to help them grow to understand those things. And honestly, um, when I was asked that question by my kids, uh, it wasn't enough for me to say because I said so. If I had said that, they would have done the right thing because they're good kids. But the right thing may have been the wrong thing, quite honestly, because it had been done for the wrong reason. What, what does First Peter 3 tell us? It says, when somebody asks you a question about why you have faith, be ready to give them an answer. Why do you believe? Faith means what you believe. So first, that's First Peter 3.15. It tells us to have an answer. And you know what it says? Give, be ready to give an answer for the faith that is in you, but do it with meekness. I love that. Do it with meekness, not arrogance. Questions are how your kid grows. Um, do this for your child. Ask them what they think about something. What do you think? Now what you're doing when you do it, you're teaching them to learn their voice. You're teaching them to learn how to be heard. You're teaching them they have value. Uh, I'm so glad that probably Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's parents somehow had taught them before they were taken into captivity because they were the best of the Hebrew boys. They were taken into Nebuchadnezzar's court. And they said to Daniel, you're going to eat these foods. You're eating at the king's table. And Daniel said, you know what? I've been taught not to eat that. Now, what Daniel didn't say, I'm not going to eat your stinking food. <laughs> if he had done that, the book of Daniel would have been ten verses. <laughs> and they cut his head off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they cut his head off. And Daniel died a brave man. That, that was not wise. You know what? So he went to his immediate supervisor. Remember what he did? Actually, he went to the captain first. And he said, I've got this thing. Can I eat this food? And he says, no, you got to have the king's food. Why would I forfeit my head for you? He's going to be checking you out. I'm not a forfeit. So then he goes to his immediate supervisor, the guy over him. He says, look, let's do a 10-day test. Let me eat these foods for 10 days. And if it doesn't look better, do with me as you need to. But can you do that? The guy goes, yeah, no, I'll do that. Because he knew he had enough time. If it was a monthly check, one week wouldn't set him back. They could, they could get back on track. He could fatten him up, whatever he had to do. So Daniel eats the fruit and vegetables. And then at the end of that week, he looked at him. He goes like, you know what? You look better than the other guys. So everybody started doing that. And, and the king goes, how are these people so wise? How are, they, how are they so good? Daniel made an appeal. I'm so glad he had been taught somewhere to find his voice. The, the miracle of that story is he found his voice. And he wasn't afraid to use it. When you ask your children questions, what do you think? How do you do this? How do you... If they find their voice, you'll never have to worry about them being secure. Now, you'll pray for it, but you're not going to be tied up in anxiety about it. That's really, really important. And what it means, you know, when you do that, you're giving not only value, you're teaching them how to use their voice. Uh, there's a right way and a wrong way to give. Daniel, Daniel could have done it the wrong way. Now, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember them? I love what it is. He says, you got to bow down and worship me. If you don't, you get thrown in this fire. Remember what they said? Long live the king. They said, this is not a rebellion against you. <laughs> How wise is that? They said, long live the king. You're asking us to do something, though, that we can't do because we worship God. And he says, and he says what God can deliver you from my hand? And they said, our God is able. But even if he doesn't, we're still going to love him. Whew. Man, that, that, that'll preach all day long. I mean, that's such an incredible statement. And he got angry. And then he throws them into the fire. And it was so hot that it burned up the guys who threw them in the fire. <laughs> and when they, they were bound up, thrown in the fire, and when they're in the fire, they're walking around, their bonds burn up. The only thing that burned on them was the bonds. 
That's so beautiful. That came off. And then the king looks in. He says, we threw in three, there's four. There's one of the sons of God with them. Now, that, that is powerful. Anyway, they come out. You remember what the king says? If you don't bow down and worship their God, then you get thrown in fire. He said, there's no God but yours. Now, this is important because through Nebuchadnezzar's life, he had a long rule. He gets off the track sometimes. But at the same time, Daniel calls him back. He goes and eats some grass for a few years and go, loses his mind for a while. He comes back and he goes like, God is God. Now, I, that, that's interesting. Those young men had a voice that spoke to, the at that time, the king of a nation. That's powerful. So ask your child's questions. There's a right way to use words. There's a wrong way. You know, Scripture, look at the, look up what words, like, like in Proverbs, look, look up the word word, and it, some words are jagged words. Some words are thrusting sharp words, like a saber, it says. Some are smooth. Some are, huh, they, they, you know, it says they're dainty morsels. I'm talking about gossip. These wrong things. Some of them are licentious. Words are important. You're teaching them how the world operates, though, when you teach them how to use their voice. And that is how things get done. You're showing them, when you ask them questions and encourage them, you're teaching them the world is interesting. The world's an interesting place. God made this incredibly wonderful world, and they, they don't, we don't want them to just spectate the world. We want them to engage it. We can do things better. You know, some of the, in our first class, they said, why did you have kids? And, and somebody said, I want, to, I want my child to make a difference in the world, make the world a better place. That's a great reason to have a child and to raise a child. We want to engage with it, not passively spectate. When you re uh, just retire and, and back off from curiosity, what happens is we, um, we just let things go that we should not let go. Um, my dad did not like me to ask questions. My dad thought I was challenging authority. Now, the truth is, I was raised in the 60s, and our big statement, the group that I ran with, was challenge authority. That was it. Uh, down with the institution. And that was it. Now, we didn't have anything to replace it with. We didn't have, we hadn't thought that far. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, yeah. We didn't, we just, you know, you got to think. Uh, but my dad did not like the questions. Listen, when you teach your child to ask questions, you know what you're teaching them? You're teaching them the way you view the world. The world is interesting, God made it, and you have endless opportunities to explain to your children how life works. Um, and that works in nature, that works in anything. Dad, how does this work? Um, when your ch child asks a question that you can't answer, you know what that is for you? That's not a threat, that's a gift. Because it's letting you know there's something you need to learn. <laughs> that puts you in a place of saying, huh, I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, that was what happened to me with the football thing. I never thought about it. what do you do when you get that challenge. I would just tell people, go to church on Sunday. If you love Jesus, you'll be in church on Sunday. And, and I had to realize that's not a bad message. It's not the only message, though. You know, and I had to realize there's a wiser way to say it. Ultimately, questions are rooted in humility. You're assuming you don't know something when you ask a question. Uh, it's, you assume there's something you don't know. Um, if you don't ask questions, you know what you'll get? You'll get bored. And boredom is a, actually it's a spiritual disease because you don't think there's anything more. You know, questions always let you know there's something more. There's something bigger, there's something better. That is one reason I love the web telescope. It makes me just go like, wow. And they're only seeing so much. There's more, you know, incredible. Um, it reflects an expanding earth and world. Um, When, when your child has a heartbreaking moment and they ask you why, you enter into something with your child. Um, I, I can't, when I had to walk with some of my kids when I went through some major disappointments in life, I'm talking with a child when he blows his leg and he wants to play college football, he knows he can, and all of a sudden you realize that could go away. Why? What did I do wrong? Why well, you didn't do anything wrong? It just happened. We can find God's strength in it. We can find His goodness in it. Those things happen when those things happen to us. And we've got to be willing to talk. Why didn't I win first place? Well, it's easy to say, well, he was better or she was better. You know, you can say that. But that still doesn't help your child. And then they'll go, well, I'm just going to quit. And go, no, that's not, that's not the answer. 
Let's ask questions here. Can you get better? Can you do this? You know, why, why do you run anyway? Or why do you swim? Why do you dive? Why do you play baseball? Why, you know, why do I strike out when I need to? Um, questions help your child grow. And it helps you grow when you enter into their deep pain. When you forbid something from discussion and say you can't ask that, you've just taught your child that you can lock things up and that you can ignore things. And you really can't do that in life. That is not a healthy way. Pe people come to me often and they say this, Pastor, do you have to... Uh, when I'm talking to them about whatever issue, and they go like, well, I wouldn't even want to talk about that you know, with anybody. And that, let's just put some things out here. Whether somebody has a, a child who's gay, whether somebody has a child who's thinking transgender, when you have these different things, and they go like, I don't even want to think about that. I go like, I don't have that luxury because I have to deal with the people who have those issues. And you have to walk with people. And it's not as easy as to say, well, here's the answer. The biggest thing is, let's love the child, let's help the child, let's do the best we can to walk with them where they are. Now, there's things we can say that are wise or foolish, but at the same time, don't avoid issues and say you can't talk about that. Um, there was a time I had a, I had a conviction to do no divorce and no remarriage. That was my biblical conviction. And I knew that it had problems with it because I knew how hard it is. You can't find a Bible verse that says that clearly the way you want it to. And so that was my standard. And somebody came to me one day and they said, Pastor, we came to know Christ in this church. We met in this church in our Bible study group. And we believe God brought us together. And would you consider marrying us? Now, we know you have a conviction about no divorce and no remarriage. So here's the thing, Pastor. If you don't believe we can be married, if you can't do the ceremony, we're going to think God just doesn't want us to be married. Now, they didn't say that to threaten me. They weren't putting pressure on me. They weren't saying, you know, uh, it, we're going to leave. They weren't saying that. They said, we're, we're just going to leave. We're going to trust you. And I said, you know what? I've never thought about that that hard with that kind of question behind it. Now, I had told my sister I wouldn't do her wedding because she was married to a divorce, get, wanting to marry a divorced guy. And I was so hard in that that his wife had died. He had gone to Vietnam in the war. She decided she didn't want to be married to him anymore. She was uh, living up with everybody else and said, I want a divorce. He comes home, finds that out. They divorce. And then she dies after that in an accident. And I was dumb enough and hard-headed enough to say, no, you're divorced, so you don't need to marry my sister. And I didn't do it. Uh, this last trip home, I sat with both of them and I said, I'm so sorry I did that. They said, dude, we're good. I said, I know you are. But I just said, I hurt you and that was stupid of me. I was unwise. I, I didn't really take that to heart. And I didn't realize I was hurting you when I did that. I was honoring God, I thought. Now, you know what? I studied the scriptures 100 hours after I was asked that question by that young couple. I said, can you give me time? It's going to take me a while to come. Because I said, if I do this, I have to teach the church why I've changed my conviction. I can't just do it. I'm going to have to teach. And it took me, I took five weeks, and I taught two hours each Sunday night on why I see this differently today. Now, the first thing I heard was, Pastor, don't believe the Bible anymore. That was some fundamentals. You know, and I had all kinds in the church. This is a good church. It had all kinds of people in it. They say, I, believe I said, no, it's not, that's not true at all. And I wasn't defensive about it. I said, I know you're going to have these questions. I'm just telling you, I've read the Scriptures, and I, here's what I believe they really teach. I think I was wrong. I was wrong. Scripture's right. I'm wrong. And you know what? That grew the church. That blessed the church. And it totally changed my life because I found my voice. And I had to face things that I was avoiding. I didn't want to do it. So I could have a conviction and say, I don't do that, so I didn't have to do it. And you know what? That's the place where I lead more people to Christ is when they come and want to get married. And I say, you know, you have to have a good spiritual foundation to start. And that is just the most beautiful place to be. There's couples in this church. Because I did premarital with them, I did their weddings, they come to know Christ, and they're part of the church. Uh, you, does it make sense to you what I'm saying? Questions are rooted in humility. And to be able to answer a question doesn't mean you're arrogant. And you don't forbid questions from being asked. You know, um, we're not afraid. The Pharisees did not want to face questions. By the way, do you know what Jesus did? When He was asked a question, do you know how many times He answered the question? Not many. He usually answered a question with a question. What must I do to have eternal life? He said, what do you think? <laughs> he goes, well, Moses' law says this. 
And, and he goes like, okay, what do you do with it? And he was asking questions. He didn't say, do this. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I mean, all the way through, when, when Nicodemus comes, how can a man be born again? He says, well, you know, you see the wind, you see this. And you, go, and, and, you know, what does that mean to you, Nicodemus? And you know what? It brings people along. And we realize that questions keep everything open for discovery. Pain, good, bad, hurt. Um, we, we need to finish, but I do want to say this in light of that. Um, somebody wrote me a, a, a note the other day, and it meant more to me than they'll ever know. Uh, but they said, they said, Pastor, we've watched you walk with people through grief. And you do that really well. They said, you really enter into that, and you help people. And uh, I thought it was a pretty descriptive email. I thought it was pretty right, even though it's humbling to read, you know. But they said, we just really think you do that well. Thank you for being willing to enter into people's pain and do that with them. You know, I can only do that, you can only do that when we have good questions. Because we don't have to have answers. What, when people are hurting, they need presence. They need you to say, we're here. And you bring a calming influence. We go back to, <laughs> you know, you enjoy the moment. Yeah, I love these people. I'm going to go be with them. And we do all the things we've been talking about. Where you have a calming influence and you work in their life for their good and you're not afraid, you know, um, to answer any question. And when they say that they're hurting, we don't go like, well, let me tell you why. You just say, I'm so sorry. And you know what? They find healing there. It's amazing how that is. But we take them to the God who loves them. Not the God who has every answer. Because you can't get an answer for sorrow. You need a reality for that. It's more than an answer. When somebody's really hurting, now why is this critical? You have to own your own path. If you don't own your own path, you can't own somebody else's path. Their path, will, when I used to say it this way, I gave somebody my brain for a few years. You cannot do that. You have to own your own path. And that's, I didn't own my own path, that's why I went to my sister's wedding. I didn't know my own path. That's why. Many different things. But when you own your own path, it gives you strength and courage to stand. Because you know who you are. And you're not afraid. And you're not arrogant either. Because it kind of beats you up. <laughs> you know, doing that. So, I really want to encourage you. Own your own path. Don't be afraid of any questions you share on that. And encourage them to ask them. Next week, we're going to fly through some good stuff. But it's been good to be with you today. Do you have any questions before we go? Good, because we're past time. All right? Uh, Pastor raised some questions this week because I encourage people to ask questions. Uh, thank you for all the encouragement you give. Thank you for the ways that you um, encourage my life and our leadership's life here. We're grateful for that. God is good. All the time. Yeah, and all the time. Lord Jesus, would you dismiss us? And would you give us a sense of uh, wonder, amazement, and uh, we're walking into a time of gathered worship. Would you let us be surprised by you today? Uh, pose a question to us. Put something to us and give us the ability, in the Lord, as well, to realize that we can find joy and meaning when we follow you. Because you're the way. You're the truth. You're the life. And we follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know,